The C-SPAN networks bring you long-form public affairs programming from the nation's capital and are a public service of your television provider. C-SPAN, created by cable. This week on Q&A, Dr. Toby Cosgrove, President and CEO of the Cleveland Clinic, discusses his 25 years with the clinic and his life in medicine. Dr. Toby Cosgrove, give us an overview of what the Cleveland Clinic is. Well, the Cleveland Clinic is a large group practice. Uh, we're about 3,200 physicians, uh, and we have facilities in Cleveland, Ohio. We have a uh, main campus and uh, eight community hospitals, 18 family health centers. We have facilities in Las Vegas, Toronto, uh, a hospital and outpatient facility uh, in uh, Fort Lauderdale and we have a very big commitment in Abu Dhabi. Uh, we're running a 750 bed general hospital in Abu Dhabi which is the largest hospital in the UAE and we're building the Cleveland Clinic Abu Dhabi. Uh, that is uh, a very big project uh, and the biggest project of its sort that Americans have ever taken on overseas. You've been CEO since 2004. Yes. Prior to that, how many heart operations did you do? <laughs> well, I was a heart surgeon for a long time. I did 22,000 procedures. What kind? Mostly cardiac surgery, mostly valve surgery. I started out doing a lot of uh, coronary bypass operations and then gradually um, migrated over to doing more valve surgery. But I've done almost all kinds of heart surgery. Why did you leave cardiology surgery and go to the administrative side? Well, cardiac surgery is, is an athletic event. Uh, you have to use your hands and you have to stand there all day long, and uh, athletes were out in time. And I've seen a lot of surgeons uh, come to the end of their careers and not stop when their athletic uh, abilities deteriorated. I wanted to stop before that happened. And uh, so I was trying to, I didn't think that I was ready to sort of hang up my spikes completely. So I didn't know exactly what I was going to do. So I uh, had looked at some opportunities. I'd been in a, started a venture capital company for the Cleveland Clinic, and I thought maybe I'd go do that. And then uh, my uh, predecessor as CEO uh, announced his retirement, and they asked me to throw my hat in the ring. And I thought, well, gee, at least I don't have to move. If you were to name one thing you've done since 2004 to improve the situation, what would it be? I think the best thing that I did was focused why we have a healthcare organization, the Cleveland Clinic. My opening uh, speech was I said, we're going to put patients first. And I handed out 40,000 buttons that said patients first. And that has been our North Star. And that is the thing that really unites us all, uh, whether you're an educator or a research scientist or an administrator or you work in the loading dock. All of us really are working there for the patient. I think that's probably the most important thing that happened. We'll get back to some of your past, uh, but the <clears throat> Cleveland Clinic has been mentioned many times over the last several months mm -hmm. because of the new health bill <clears throat> that comes in effect on October the 1st. I wanted to show you a little bit of a speech that Senator Ted Cruz of Texas made on the floor of the Senate when he did his marathon speech. He mentioned you, and let's let you break this down. Some members of this body might say, well, these are hard times. Everyone's struggling. So maybe the Cleveland Clinic is just responding to economic challenges. Who's to say what the Cleveland Clinic is doing has anything to do with Obamacare? Well, Madam President, the answer to that is who's to say? The Cleveland Clinic is to say. A spokeswoman for the Cleveland Clinic said, quote, to prepare for health care reform, Cleveland Clinic is transforming the way care is delivered to patients. She added that $330 million would be cut from the clinic's annual budget. You want to talk about direct job losses from Obamacare, go to Cleveland, Ohio. Go to those working at the Cleveland Clinic. Go to those depending on the Cleveland Clinic for health care. And that's one very real manifestation of the train wreck that is Obamacare. What do you think? Well, I think what we have to understand is what's going on in health care across the country. Uh, and we have gotten ourselves in a situation where we knew we had to change health care. 
health care has become so expensive in the United States uh, that it's now uh, consuming 18 percent of the GDP. It's starting to eat into things like education and other social programs that we want to have and need to have. Uh, and we are more expensive than any other country in the world. Uh, and we have to de uh, harness uh, that inflation rate. We have to control it and bring the cost down uh, so that we can remain competitive. Now, we've been at this a long time uh, and beginning to, to drive this. It is a process that started several years ago uh, and how we have begun to try to make our healthcare delivery more efficient. Uh, we have, for example, we've consolidated services in hospitals. We have uh, closed one hospital that was two miles from 2,000 beds hospitals, and frankly, uh, we've, we've uh, consolidated services. Uh, we consolidated services for obstetrics, for re rehabilitation, for cardiac surgery, for pediatrics, um, and uh, and for trauma, and just for example in trauma, when we consolidated the services from five trauma centers in Cleveland to three, we saw a 20% uh, improvement in mortality rates. So this has been a long process of where we're trying to reform this, and what's going on right now is that it's uh, a lot of the things are coming to a head. Um, that we have concentrated on taking out costs over the last couple of years, for example, in things like purchasing, in the last two years, we took $180 million out of purchasing. Um, so we've been, and we have done things like eliminated uh, redundancies. We've uh, put uh, blocks in so you can't order redundant lab tests and eliminated some 12,000 tests that would have been redundant. So we've been working on this all, all along. Now we know that there are, are things that are happening right now that uh, we're getting paid, going to be paid less by private and public payers. Uh, insurance uh, companies are, are paying us less, uh, Medicare is paying us less, sequestration had an effect on hospitals, uh, the NIH uh, funding decreasing has had an effect on our uh, research, and so we had to uh, decrease our costs still further. Um, and all of this goes into trying to change how healthcare comes together. It's not one single thing that did it. It's not one single pair that did it. It's not one program that's done it. It's a whole series of things that we were doing starting back five, six, seven years ago and culminating in when we decided we, these changes are so significant in terms of what we're going to get paid that we now have to uh, be even more stringent. And that's what led to offering people early retirement. Did you expect that after you made this announcement that the, the Obamacare connection was going to be made? Absolutely not. You know, what I, my, my biggest concern was for the people that worked at the Cleveland Clinic and the Cleveland Clinic. We are concerned about uh, driving great quality health care and we're looking after our employees because our employees, all of us, all of our caregivers are really are what the Cleveland Clinic is. We're not buildings, we're people. Uh, and so my concern really was about those people and how we could either make that transition uh, most graceful if we had to do it or to reduce the, uh, its effect. Now, I thought it would have implications for the local community and we reached out in many different directions to tell people what we were doing and why it was coming. And I had a, a, a nine month scheduled meeting um, that I do every quarter where we televise it to all of our locations, and I thought this is the time for me to stand up and explain to the organization what's going on and what we're going to do as a result, and I did that, and I never thought that this was something that was going to become a political football. This was concern about delivering great care and looking after the people who do it. How many employees do you have? We have 43,000. How many will you reduce it to because of your cutbacks? Well, what we have offered them is uh, 3,000 people we've offered early retirement. We expect that we'll get six or 800 people to take that. Now, we don't know exactly uh, what the long-term implications are. Will we have to reduce it more? We, we won't. We'll have to wait and see. But we're uh, poised, if we have to reduce it further, to do that in January. How much money do you collect a year, and, are, and how is it that you're nonprofit? We're a six and a half billion dollar organization. 
uh, and we uh, are not profit organization like almost every other hospital in the country. We all the we, there's no stockholders, there's no shareholders, there's no incentives, there's no bonuses. All of the residual goes back into building the organization, doing the research, and paying the employees. You've specifically pointed out in the past that I read that there is no tenure at the Cleveland Clinic. Yeah. Explain why you say that, and what difference does that make? I think that's a really good, a really good point. We're, we're all of us are salaried. Um, and we have no financial incentives. So I could look at you and say, you need a heart operation, uh, and I'm, that's what I'm going to suggest to you. And it would have no effect whatsoever on my back pocket. Uh, it's all about uh, whether I think you need it or not. And so I have, that's a wonderful feeling to be able to say to a patient, I think you need something, and not have them worried that you're doing it for your own financial uh, benefit. So all of us are salaried, um, and uh, we have annual professional reviews. So each year, uh, we sit down with each doctor, and we go through what, uh, how they're doing, and, and they tell us what they think they need from the organization. It's a wonderful way uh, to get that feedback. And frankly, it's the way almost every business in the country works. Now, except healthcare for most, in the most part. Well, let me add the uh, question. Uh, However, you're not tenured, but the more heart surgery you do, the more you bring to the hospital, the more money that comes in, the better off everybody can do. Well, that's correct, but it, the direct one-to-one -one relationship is not there. For example, um, if you're a psychiatrist, for example, and we need you to help us with our transplant program, you're not going to make any bring any money to the Cleveland Clinic. But we don't want you thinking about the fact that you, know, you got to do something else rather than what the institution needs. And we all get paid on the basis of our total contribution to the organization. And the contribution might be clinical, it might be research, it might be education, it might be a combination of those, it might be management, um, it might be business, uh, and all of those things go into how we decide to pay people. Now, um, and. The annual professional, the fact that we don't have tenure, I think, is a wonderful thing. Tenure, frankly, uh, allows us to say to people, look, you know, you, you're not fitting into the organization. Um, you're not contributing to the organization. And thank you very much for your service, and uh, you find time to go. When you think back uh, on your career in those 22,000 operations, if you had to pick one or two that you'll always remember, what would you pick? You know, this is, um, this is a tough thing to say for a, a surgeon, but surgeons don't remember the successes. They remember the failures. And, the th and you always learn more from those failures than you do from your successes. And you play them over and over and over in your mind. Uh, happily, uh, cardiac surgery over time became quite safe, uh, but those, those failures really, like, stand out in your mind and you replay them and remember them even to this day. What's a failure? Somebody dying. And how often did that happen to you? It happened less and less. <clears throat> you know, it's, it's interesting. Um, cardiac surgery when I started was in its infancy. I remember being a medical student walking at a, working at Boston Children's Hospital. In one day, we lost five children terrible to come back the next day and try and do that, do it again. And when I was a resident, you know, mortality rates for cardiac surgery were double digits. And then so my whole career was trying to get the mortality and the morbidity of cardiac surgery to come down. Now the mortality for cardiac surgery is 1% or less. Uh, and it's and the complications and the stay in the operating room and the incisions and the quality of the outcome has gotten better and better over time. When did you decide to put on your website <clears throat> how many operations are held in the last year and how many people died from them? Yeah, it's an interesting story because uh, I became, uh, uh, about uh, 25 years ago, I became chairman of cardiac surgery. And we always work hand in glove with a cardiologist. Cardiologists to see the patient, make the diagnosis, and then potentially refer them to, to cardiac surgery. And I thought it was very important for the uh, cardiologist to be part of the team and understand what the potential for outcomes uh, for the, from cardiac surgery were. 
So we had, at the end of each year, we had a report where we asked all the cardiologists to come and we all gathered and we stood up and re, uh, one after another reported the results of coronary bypass or aortic valve replacement or mitral valve replacement, something like that. Then the cardiologists started to ask us for the results, so we put together a little booklet that had all these results in so they could in intelligently tell the patient, look, the risk of what I'm suggesting is this. Uh, and then we said, let's, uh, let's distribute it uh, nationally uh, because we think that every time you look at those results, you always find something that you can do better. And it's a, it's a, a regular, a steady improvement looking at all those little things that are not as good as they should be. So we put it out there and then when I became CEO, I said, let's do it for everything. Uh, let's do it for cardiac surgery and for dermatology, and et cetera. Now, the issue really was, and cardiac surgery is pretty easy to, to give you the results. You know, people either make it or they don't make it. Um, and so you count up the results pretty easily. It's much harder in a lot of the other specialties. Take dermatology, for example. You know, what is quality dermatology? Uh, dermatology. I mean, I said to the dermatologist, you can't just tell us you're a great dermatologist. Show me some numbers. Give me some metrics. So what uh, I asked them to do is set up the metrics for their specialty. And so we now have 17 or so outcomes books that we publish. Each year they get more sophisticated. And we should talk about the good, the bad, and the ugly. Um, but it's transparency. And transparency is a wonderful thing. Transparency and quality and, and really didn't happen at all in medicine up until maybe 15, 20 years ago. Whose decision was it to put your 990 tax form on the website? Um, that's part of our transparency. When did that start? I can't tell you. I don't remember, actually. I want to show you some video of a former vice president talking about cardiology, <clears throat> Mr. Cheney. And I got a phone call one day, this is just before the transplant, from the Cleveland Clinic. And they were going to put on a conference on innovation in cardiology and care of heart disease. And they said, we've got all the suppliers coming, the makers of the devices and so forth. We've got a lot of the docs coming. But they said, uh, we decided we need a patient. And uh, somebody said, well, let's get Cheney. He's had everything done to him you can do to a heart patient, <laughs> which was true. Up to that point, I hadn't had transplant yet, but this gave us the idea that you can tell the story of that 40-year miracle, really, of what's happened with respect to our ability to, to deal with heart disease in this country uh, through my story and my case history. Is there any way to connect what went on in his life and all the heart um, operations he had and heart attacks to Ob Obamacare and what will change because of that? I think that's hard. I think, uh, well, first of all, I, I was there and heard him uh, very eloquently describe uh, and very personally describe what had gone on. At that point, he had an artificial uh, assist uh, in him. And just to, to put sort of the things in perspective, we're now almost 50 years into the development of a artificial heart and left ventricular assist. He lived uh, on the basis of that research um, for several couple of years waiting for a heart transplant. And, and you know, that is a tremendous amount of investment over time and improvement. Um, I hope uh, that we're going to be able to continue to do that sort of research going forward. That's an important uh, aspect for all of us. Um, and uh, whether it's in heart or whether it's in cancer or whatever specialty it's in, we need to continue to um, have those sorts of missions. Now, if you look at uh, academic medical centers across the country, um, they have a tripartite mission, as we do. They're educating people, to, they are researching, and they're taking care of patients. So we need to continue to do that, and you know we'll have to see how that all works out over time. How much federal money do you get a year? We get uh, about seventy million dollars. What for? Uh, for research of the research money. That's how have you been? NIH hit, money. How have you been hit in this sequester era? <laughs> we have uh, been flat over the last several years in the amount of NIH money that we get for research, and we get other monies from other locations. You said that there are 27,000 pages of regulations that have come out of the Obamacare bill? Yeah. Has that ever happened in your life? 
<laughs> well, it hasn't happened in medicine. That's about equi equivalent to what the IRS does. Twenty. Where, where, what do they say? Well, I'll be honest with you. I'm dyslexic. I haven't read them all. <laughs> Um, I, we, they, they are continuing to outline uh, how uh, we're going to set up uh, these types of uh, care delivery system and how we're going to get paid, etc. What would you have done if somebody had asked you to write this bill? Differently, maybe? I think, um, well, I think w one of the things we understand is we had to have access. And I think the bill's done a great job of providing access. Um, access to what? Access to in insurance co coverage so that people uh, don't wind up just going to emergency room but get some sort of a continuum of care along the way. And that's been a, a process that's uh, ongoing. Um, but we knew, know we had to take the cost out. Uh, and there's only really two ways that you can take cost out of health care. Uh, one is you have to make a more efficient delivery system, and I think we're on our way to getting a more efficient delivery system. The other one is we have to reduce the burden of disease in the United States. We can't, we have to take care of ourselves a little bit. Um, and smoking and obesity uh, and lack of exercise are very big factors right now in driving up the cost of health care. Obesity, for example, now accounts for 10% of the health care costs in the United States. And, and we are in the midst of a, a tsunami of uh, obesity across the United States. <clears throat> and um, that, we, we have to deal with that. That was left pretty much alone in the bill. And I would have liked to have seen more emphasis on uh, trying to help educate people about uh, taking care of themselves and, and helping uh, all of society, from food manufacturers right to educators to um, food uh, providers, uh, to understand that we need to uh, understand this ep epidemic of obesity and begin to make it change. After you analyzed those 27,000 pages and you had a board meeting and you <clears throat> took this to your board, what did you tell them that the impact's going to be on the Cleveland Clinic in the future? Well, what we did is we gradually over time uh, have been, you know, at each board meeting we've been bringing the, the board along so they understand it as we understood it. And then we have told them that we've gone through the financial projections for the Cleveland Clinic as a result of all the things that are changing. Not just, not just one thing, but everything that's changing across healthcare on our financial projections for the future. And, you know, we rec recognize that uh, we had to reduce our expenses substantially uh, going forward. Did anybody get their salaries cut? We have not cut salaries and what we want to do is we want to keep the people who want to stay there and who are good workers and we want to uh, continue to pay them well at a competitive rate. In fact, we, keep, we pay competitive rates f for doctors, for nurses, for everybody who works at the Cleveland Clinic relative to what they do. What would you say to an insurance company that you deal with all the time about what they do that you don't like that they do? Well, we've talked to the insurance companies. In fact, I was talking with the CEO of some of the insurance companies last night. And I said, you know, it's important that we begin to figure out how we're going to work together better. We have to take the friction out of the gears of the transaction between the two uh, different organizations and reduce that. Um, for example, if uh, we send in a, uh, a bill for someone who's had a delivery, uh, they have someone who checks the bill out. And then they pay us, and we have someone who checks if they paid us the right amount. Wouldn't it be nice if we could just say, let's figure out how much it costs and how much you're going to pay us for a delivery and, and what the average delivery costs, and, you know, that's what we get paid. And that, and we'll take the checkers out at both ends. That's taking sand out of the gears. There's a television uh, personality that played a role in, in uh, or maybe it's you played a role in his life. His name's Dr. Oz. Here is a clip from that, and we'll get you to explain it. And Toby Cosgrove, first day I walk in the door, says, "What are you doing tonight?" And I said, "Well, I don't know. I guess I go read a book in the library." So no, no, I got tickets to the Indians, and he took me, a nobody. <laughs> just a visitor to an Indians game where he gave me some food and brought me down but he talked to me about life and why I had come to Cleveland and what I was going to do at the clinic and what his passion was about medicine and you know this is many years ago we've stayed close friends since but it taught me a lot about how you treat people and someone at his level 
because he was a division chief at that time, but ultimately became the head of the whole institution, really is a, a you know, towering figure in medicine, mm -hmm. could take care of someone young and just coming out the way he did, that's a role model that I want to expound and I want to follow, and I've done that, I've tried. When did you first learn to use that philosophy, treating people? Hmm. You know, I, I, I think probably the first time it came along was my time in Vietnam. I, I, was in, I ran a, a casualty staging fight in Vietnam where we had, we'd get, uh, you know, 50 to 100 sick and wounded new troops in every day. And I, my job was to go from bed to bed to bed to make sure that they're ready to fly and get on an airplane. And I realized at that point, just the plain touching of them made a difference. I didn't have hours to spend with each one of them, but I would touch them. Maybe I just shake their hand or touch their toe, or and I recognize that it made a difference as a personal connection with people. I think you learn these things as you go along, but that was one of those things that I remember vividly. What years were you in Vietnam? I went through right after the Tet Offensive, 1968-69. What's the impact on your life, Vietnam experience? Um, well. I learned lots of things. First of all, I learned the horrors of war. Um, there is no such thing as a good war. Where were you? I was in Da Nang. At the time uh, I arrived there, they were fighting on the perimeter, and we watched a firefight from the hospital. Um, and uh, then I also learned a lot about the world um, and people, um, and I learned about mil medicine and the military. They do some terrific things. They had a transportation system, for example. The picked helicopter, you'd pick you up in the field, move you to a station where they'd stop the bleeding and splint your wounds or whatever, then move you to a back uh, line hospital uh, where you could get the most sophisticated care. Then they'd, after they got you patched up, they'd send them to me and we'd evacuate them to Japan or the Philippines or someplace. <coughs> Actually, we, we took that idea and we did the same thing for our, our system. We set a transportation system up. So we don't think all hospitals can be all things to all people. We think you move the patient to the right location at the right time for the right care. So we have fixed wings, we have uh, helicopters, we have ambulances, and we move about 20,000 patients a year to the right location for the right care. Um, and that way we can concentrate people with a similar sort of problem uh, in a, a location and it drives up the quality and it drives up the efficiency. It's called the practice of medicine. The more you practice, the better you get at it. And so let people practice. How did you become a doctor in the service and what service was it? Uh, well, I was, uh, it was the time of uh, the Vietnam War and so we all had to go, we all got commissions coming out of medical school. And so I went after I had a surgical internship and a year of surgical residency and um, I went uh, into the Air Force and straight to Da Nang. What did you think of the war when you were in the middle of it? You know, it, it, it's, uh, first of all, the war was, uh, the human effects of a war are really horrible. Um, I thought that, um, you know, it, it was hard to understand it. It was uh, hard to understand the reporting of it. Um, I was there at, uh, at the same time as David Halberstam was. David and I have, David and I have subsequently, before he died, was killed um, in a car wreck, uh, we used to talk about the war quite a lot and its effect on both of us and how we had different perspectives on it, I from the medical side and he from reporting it and then others from fighting it. It was uh, difficult to understand from any one position in it. Did you change your mind about the war at any time in the last 40 years? I, I don't uh, think I did. I, I am not enthusiastic about the United States getting involved in overseas activities. What about, uh, what, what part of that conversation with David Halberstam, he was one of our early guests on this program, uh, do you remember and wh how did you two differ or did you? Well, he was, he, he was much more into the bigger picture of it and, and was uh, very, um, upset about the U.S. involvement there and the people who were there leading uh, and was very vocal about it, as you may remember. And I was a little more confused and uh, but very uh, concerned, not only about the patients I was taking care of, but uh, the effect it was having on the Vietnamese populace. I ran a clinic for the, for the Vietnamese during the time that I was there, uh, trying to help them as, along the way as well. 
you applied to 13 medical schools, 12 <laughs> said no, the University of Virginia said yes. Thank goodness. You talk often about your being a C student, a D student and all that. Now, at 32 you discover you're dyslexic. How did you get into University of Virginia? I think that they um, were very benevolent. <laughs> I don't know why they took me, to be perfectly honest with you. Um, that, but I'm awfully glad they did, and they treated me very well. Uh, they gave me a great education, um, and I am eternally appreciative. But what does that say, though, about you've gone on to run the Cleveland Clinic, one of the biggest hospitals in the world. How many patients do you see a year? Not you, but the, the <coughs> clinic. Uh, we see multiple millions. And you did 22,000 operations as a cardiologist. Mm -hmm. Go back to the education part of this. Why did those 12 turn you down? And well, because I, I, you know, frankly, I went to Williams College, and I was not a great student at Williams College. In fact, I frequently tell a story about uh, taking French. I never heard a word of French take, spoken in my life when I went to college, and so I thought, well, heck, I better learn about uh, speaking French, a language. Well, I found out that uh, I couldn't do French at all. I first day I walked in, and everybody was saying "wee oui, wee," oui, and I looked up and down the page for "w e w e" and couldn't find it any place. Um, and uh, it turns out that I had four semesters of remedial French and th three D minuses and a D. And um, so I was not a great student. I worked very hard, but the amount of reading and languages that I had to do in college really were difficult. So I'm not surprised that not most medical uh, most medical schools didn't take me. Now I think the interesting thing is going back and uh, looking at this now understanding that I am dyslexic, uh, it, it, I realized that dyslexia was really a gift because I think about things differently. I look at things differently. I, um, and also it taught me tremendous persistence. And if you look at the writings uh, on dyslexia now, a person by the name of Sally Shaywitz at Yale, a professor there is probably the expert on dyslexia. Sally will say that she finds that uh, dyslexic people are more creative because they think differently than other people do. Um, I've seen that thing in myself and in my family. What's well, the first thing that tells you you're a dys dyslexic, dyslexic and why did it take till you were 32 years old to find out? Well, I never heard the word before until I was that age. Uh, and, and people didn't uh, recognize it as a, particularly as a defect or a learning disability at that point. Um, and uh, so I just thought I was not very quick. How do you know? I mean, what is it that you see that we don't see? Well, you know, I, I, I can't tell you that, but, you know, I've wound up uh, developing a bunch of products and I have a whole bunch of patents that uh, came out of the results of that. And I gather that I must think about things differently than other people do to do that. And, um, you know, I uh, have got a daughter who's dyslexic, and she is the same way. She's now become a fashion designer, um, following um, a difficult uh, academic career from age four all the way through college. But as you, I mean, if you're reading a book versus doing an operation, is there two different experiences? Oh, yeah, painful to read, very painful to read. Uh, I, I don't think I've ever read a novel. It's just. It's How not, do you read reports? How did you? Uh, I, I work at it. I, it's it's work. I have to go up and settle down and uh, find a quiet place where there's no distraction and uh, uh, concentrate, take notes, write in, in the margins, go back and reread it slowly. It's very painful. But getting back to education, you know what the system is. You take mm -hmm. the SAT test. You have to get good <laughs> grades and all that. Is there something wrong with that? Well, yeah, we, you know, we really have to think about uh, letting people who have that diagnosis have extra time because they're not dumb; they're just slow, um, and uh, have extra time on time tests. And a lot of the uh, reading can be changed into tapes. Uh, so there's a lot of accommodations that can be made for people who are dyslexic. And frankly, I've been involved with Chuck Swab, for example, is also dyslexic. 
he and I have talked to a bunch of the administrator, uh, admissions people in colleges about uh, allowing people to have time tests and uh, bringing, uh, letting people who are dyslexic come in because they can be very productive members of society. Go back to the uh, Obamacare issue. I want to run this from 2009 with uh, our now president talking about uh, this whole business. The reason I visited the Cleveland Clinic is because, along with the Mayo Clinic, they have been able to drive down costs more than any other health care system out there while maintaining some of the highest quality. Now, when I asked, you know, how did you go about doing it? Well, they started this thing. When was it started? Cleveland Clinic? 1921. And they, what, what they've done is, for example, Doctors who are part of the Cleveland Clinic get paid a salary instead of being paid fee for service. So that makes it easier for them to make some of these changes because people don't feel like maybe they're losing some money out of pocket. They just know that they're getting a salary. Should everybody else do what you've done? I'll get rid of the tenure, pay the salary, not fee for service. Well, I think increasingly we're starting to see th that, that happen. It, it's interesting how this is coming about. We're seeing now um, a tr consolidation in healthcare. We're seeing hospitals come together in systems. We're also seeing now doctors want to be salaried. 60% of the doctors in the United States now are salaried. Uh, and if you look at the people graduating from medical school, they would prefer to be salaried rather than uh, going out and being uh, self-employed. So it's a major shift. So people are coming closer and closer to our model of care where the, you work with the hospital or for the hospital. Um, it's a, we have a slight difference. Uh, we're a group practice that has facilities. There are, and the other is a hospital that employs physicians. That's a subtle difference, but an important difference for us. How many buildings do you have on the Cleveland campus? Oh gosh, uh, we have 160 acres on the main campus and probably 60, 70 buildings. Again, how many doctors? Uh, 3,200 physicians. And how do you hire them based on what you just talked about, not getting in 12 medical schools, how do you approach I mean, only the Harvard doctors getting in? Oh, no. You know, we look for uh, physicians. Uh, first of all, let me say that Cleveland, uh, coming to work in Cleveland is a great filter. Because people aren't coming to Cleveland to go to the beach or go skiing. Uh, they're coming to Cleveland because they're interested in working there. And that's a great filter. Uh, and so people are coming there because they want to want to work. Uh, and they want to work in the sort of system that we have. So. That's, that's a terrific uh, opportunity for us, and uh, we look for people who are really uh, concentrating and driven and uh, about uh, driving great health care um, and great quality. They're probably not going to get paid as much as they can make other places. In fact, you know, just to give you an example of that, when I started out, um, I was doing about 500 heart operations um, a year, and I was getting paid 50 or 60 thousand uh, dollars. Two years after I'd been there, I was offered another job to go work and make a million dollars. I stayed at the Cleveland Clinic because I liked that uh, environment and the teamwork that went with it. How many doctors were there at the Cleveland Clinic when you started? <laughs> There were 140 doctors when I came to the Cleveland Clinic. It's uh, it's grown a little. And what? How many of your patients are from Ohio? Well, we we draw most of our patients from a six-county area around. About 80 percent of our patients come from the six-county area around that, and then the the rest of them from a about a five-state area around that. But we have people from all over the United States. About less than one percent come from overseas. I read that 132 different nations have shipped people to your clinic. Um, how do you deal with that? Who can come? Anybody can come. You know, we, we, we look after is, uh, is the largest number of Medicaid patients in the state of Ohio. Uh, and uh, we, uh, we take everybody. So the lawyers, meanwhile, are getting $1,000 an hour in this town. Their rates keep going up. They're not on salary. And you have something called malpractice. How much of that $6 billion a year that you 
gross uh, goes to malpractice insurance? Um, our malpractice costs last year were about fifty million dollars. Up, down, uh, compared actually to the past? They've been, actually they've been coming down. We've worked very hard at bringing them down. Uh, we've done several things to bring them down. Uh, one of the things we did is we said, look, when we have a problem and we know we've had a problem with a patient, we go to them and say, you know, we had a problem. And we're really sorry um, uh, about whatever had happened. Uh, we'll do everything we can to make it right, but we want to be straightforward with you. The second thing we did is we opened up the medical record for everybody. About five years ago, we said, this is not Cleveland Clinic's record, this is your record. So you, you can read it anytime you want. And we sign everybody up for their electronic medical record when they come for visits because we want them engaged. And if you take away the secrecy of what's going on, and if you take away the fact that you might be hiding something, it really is, is it does begin to decrease the number of lawsuits that you have. Have any idea how many doctors you've hired over the years? Me personally? Yeah. Uh, gee, I, I was responsible mostly for hiring the physicians that worked in cardiac surgery when I was running it, and probably over time I must have hired 30 just on the staff, and, pro and then there were all the residents and fellows who came to work there, and those were in the hundreds. We, we have, for example, uh, about uh, 1,800 residents and fellows in training at any one time, so we're a very large education organization. So as, a, as somebody comes in front of you, what are your, what's your own criteria about whether or not you hire somebody? Well, I think you look for a number of things. First of all, uh, I think you have to find someone who you think has had the training uh, they have the dedication to what they want to do, and uh, I think interpersonal uh, communication capabilities are a big part of that, with emotional intelligence. How often do you look at their grade point average? Almost never. Why? Uh, because by the time they come to us for to be hired, uh, they've gone from college and medical school, and now they've gone through uh, coming into a residency. Um, and I, so I look, they're generally the ones that are applying to us are top portion of their class and I don't really care whether they're number one or number 15 or 20, but we get top applicants so I don't go to that. Based on what you know now, if you're predicting what the world will look like in medicine in this country <coughs> in five years, based on this new law that comes in October the 1st, what do you tell people? Well, I, have to, I think that what we're doing, and this, I think you have to understand that this is not all the law. This is about the economics of this country. And, you know, we have a, a patriotic duty to reduce the cost of health care in the United States, or at least, and, and also keep the quality first class. So there are going to be a number of things that are going to change. Um, who, what's your insurance? Who you're going to get your insurance from is going to probably change. Um, who you're going to see in uh, the medical uh, community, your caregiver is going to change. You're going to see a lot more people who are physician's assistants because there's a shortage of physicians across the country. Good or bad? I think that's a good thing, actually, because it allows uh, everybody to practice at the top of their capabilities. Physicians do physician work, uh, and nurses should do nurse work and not have, tech have technicians help them. So we're going to bring a whole new workforce that is going to come in to look after the shortage of doctors and nurses. So the people that are going to look after you are going to be different. The diseases we're treating are clearly different. The, uh, chronic, or chronic diseases have gone way up, acute diseases have gone down, um, so that you're going to see more people treated as outpatients um, instead of being inpatients. Um, uh, and you've seen that happen already with surgery going to outpatient or from inpatient. You've also uh, seen that people with chronic disease are going to be treated in, as an outpatient and at home, so you're going to have more outpatient visits, and that's been going on now for 15 years, and more home care. As, uh, so where are you going to be treated, who's going to treat you, and the sort of diseases you're going to be treated for is all going to change. What percentage of the Cleveland Clinic's money comes from Medicaid or Medicare? Uh, Medic well, if you Medicare is about uh, twenty, about thirty percent of Medicare. Medicaid is about fifteen percent, uh, and then they're private payers, and then people don't pay at all. In five years, what will those percentages be? I think people are th I think that there's going to be a bigger percentage, and probably in ten years, 
uh, probably 70% will be some sort of government pay, Medicare, Medicaid uh, of some sort. And that's not just the change in who pays, it's also the change in the demographics of the country because more people are going to be in the Medicare age group. And what will that impact be on you? Well, I think the impact on us is, is going to be that uh, it's going to depend upon what happens to those payment systems. Right now, for example, in Ohio, uh, there's no Medicaid. Uh, they haven't had a Medicaid expansion. Um, and that's about, for the state of Ohio, that's about a $14 billion nut um, over a period of time. Um, and that, um, we think that that makes sense both from an economic standpoint to get that passed, and it also makes sense in terms of a humanitarian standpoint to get that uh, bill passed. I hope that it happens soon. So what, what about the individual, though, sitting in this country? If you, <clears throat> We've had a lot of promises over the last five years uh, from politicians, a lot of complaining. People are saying it's the worst thing that's ever happened is going to bring the country down, and then the other side says it's going to, President Obama said it's going to cut your bill by $2,500 a year. Where do you come down on this? We don't know, uh, frankly. No idea? Uh, I, we, we really don't know. Um, we don't know how this is going to play out uh, over time. I think if you look at the bill in general, uh, we knew we had to change, um, and we're in the process of changing. Uh, it's, it, it is not a perfect bill, probably never been a perfect bill written. Uh, and there are going to be changes that are going to happen over the next five to ten years to that bill to um, modify it. Um, and so I, I don't think we can tell you at this point what it's going to mean. We've got so many factors that are going on. Is obesity going to continue? Is the population going to continue to age? Are we going to be able to eliminate uh, diseases like uh, heart disease and cancer? Are we going to find new ways of treating people? That uh, And so to tell you that I know the answer to this, I don't know the answer to this. I do know that it's a major change. I know there's going to be adjustments. I know that there's going to be new ways that we're going to treat people and care for people. Uh, but all the time, I think the quality is going to go up and, the, and uh, health care in the United States ultimately will deliver uh, great care like it does now. Why is the health care in this country so much more expensive than it is overseas? One of the reasons is that um, we have put our emphasis in a different place in the United States. The emphasis in, uh, is always been on treating people who are at the end of uh, their lives and very sick. Cancer, heart disease, we put on, and we've, in fact, in the last 20 years, we've driven down the deaths from heart disease by 20 percent uh, across the United States. It made a big difference. Uh, so we put our emphasis there in the high tech. A lot of other places uh, have put their emphasis uh, in other places, primary care, for example. Uh, a great example of that is what happened in China after uh, the Second World War. Uh, the life expectancy was in the high 20s at the end of the war, primarily from infectious disease and starvation. And just by public health uh, measures, they doubled it. Um, and now, on the other hand, if you look in Russia, you see the life expectancy of males going down um, because of alcoholism and uh, suicides, etc. So, you know, it's, there's a lot of uh, difference in where people put the emphasis and um, where they uh, put their money. We have not had a national system. It's been you know, entrepreneurs, various locations. Every hospital was built as a standalone. Doctors were independent. Uh, there was not a national health care system across the country, much uh, different from where I practiced in London, for example. Which country in the world, besides the United States and your opinion, has the best medical system? That's a tough one. I think every one of them has a, uh, something that uh, you admire. Uh, Germany has been very effective in some of the things that they've done in, in combining uh, private and government uh, pay. Uh, they have done a terrific job um, in putting emphasis on primary care in England. Um, so, you know, I think you try to look at the best you can find in various uh, countries. Why is the Cleveland Clinic building an Abu Dhabi hospital? Ah, I'm glad you asked. <coughs> uh, it's an interesting story, um, and it's a story that was uh, sort of goes back to 9/11. Uh, 
And in 9-11, we were seeing about 35 patients uh, a month, uh, particularly from the Middle East, um, and uh, for heart surgery, just heart surgery. And uh, it went to five in two weeks. Uh, and uh, that uh, started us on uh, the opportunity to begin to look and could we do something that would meet these patients uh, other places. We'd operate on the King of Saudi Arabia on a couple occasions and a lot of uh, members of the royal families and it had been good for the Cleveland Clinic economically. Um, and as we began to look, um, there were about 60 or 70 countries approached us about coming and doing a facility in their country. And we said there have to be five criteria to pick, pick it out. These are sort of really basic. One, it had to be a stable country. Two, we had to have a stable partner. Three, it was not going to be uh, Cleveland Clinic money invested there because I wasn't going to invest uh, uh, Cleveland money in another country. Thirdly, it had to be a uh, financial return to the Cleveland Clinic. And fourth, I thought we had to deliver value, uh, and that was going to require a long-term relationship. That was going to require that um, we were there to transfer our culture to them, and that's really what they wanted. And uh, Abu Dhabi fit all those criteria. How many beds? Uh, we're running a 750-bed hospital there uh, right now, uh, and we're building the Cleveland Clinic Abu Dhabi, which ultimately have 500 beds. Earlier you mentioned patents. How many have you received over the years? 30. And give us an example of what some of them are. Um, well, I uh, developed a ring for repairing mitral valves that, that holds the annulus in place and you put it in when you do that. What year? Uh, yeah, it must have been uh, almost 20 years ago. How did you invent that? Well, um, I knew that the, at the time, uh, one of the problems that happens with the mitral valve has got two little leaflets that come together like this. And Where is the mitral valve? It's in the middle of the heart, on the left side of the heart. And uh, these two valve leaflets come together like this, and they're held together in a ring. And, and when some people, the ring dilates, and so the leaflets don't bump against each other. They, uh, they don't come together, and so the blood leaks backwards. So people were using a ring that was rigid at that time, and I knew that the heart was not a rigid structure. It went like this, uh, contracted, and so I thought, gee, you know, what we want, really want to do is develop a ring that we put in that flexes with the heart, which will be more physiologic. And so I tried a number of things, but you know, I'd put a stitch through the heart and then I'd put it through some flexible piece and I'd tie it down and depending if I'd had a big breakfast in the morning or not, how tightly I tied the knot. And so I, there was no sort of measured way to reduce the circumference of the, of the ring that uh, around the valve. And so I remembered back, have you ever seen an embroidery hoop? You know, it's a hoop that holds a piece of cloth tight, and you put the stitches through, and you pull them tight, then you take it off, and you've got an embroidered handkerchief or something like that. I said, that's what we're going to do. So we made a little frame that held the piece of cloth tight, and we put the stitches through, tied the stitches down, then you took the frame off, and you had a flexible piece with a measured reduction. So that was some of the thinking that went into it. Sort Does of. everybody use that now? Well, it's, it's probably <laughs> one of the most used in the world. When you were operating, what was your day like? What time did you start? Oh, we went, the operating room started at 8 o'clock, and I, I would get there at uh, 7, and I'd generally get home after 7. How many would you do a day? Um, I've done as few as two and as many as six or seven. What would you advise patients that are, have a heart problem? <clears throat> what, do you, what would you say to them to try to put them at ease, and what, what do they most often worry about? Besides the obvious death. Well, everybody worries about that, I, I, I think. But, uh, and the, and the, other, the second thing they worry about is strokes. Uh, and so we talked very candidly about, you know, we've looked at who's at risk of this, of a stroke, who's at risk of dying. We can tell them and project what their risks are, and we tell them in a very matter-of-fact way about that. Um, and I think probably the other thing is, uh, People don't want to go to war with somebody that they don't know. And I think that, that you go to, they think they're going to war, and so you look them, talk to them straight. Uh, and they appreciate that. The other thing is we found 
we give classes to people uh, who are going to have heart surgery because it used to be that everybody used to be terribly anxious. They thought, geez, I'm the only one that's ever going to happen to. And, and so then you'd take 10 or 15 people in and put them in a class and say, okay, here's what's going to happen to you the next day. So they thought, well, you know, it's like group therapy. They're all marching through this together and it's a very calming effect on people. You were born in 1940. Mm -hmm. Makes you about 73. Yes. How long are you going to do this? Well, um, I'm going to be there for a couple more years, anyhow, um, uh, or until such time as something happens to me or the Board of uh, Trustees says it's time for me to move on or if I get tired of it. You're talking about obesity. What do you personally do to stay in shape? Um, I use the elliptical on a regular basis uh, and I, look what, I watch what I eat. And how have you seen over the years the obesity change? Well, you know, I grew up in a little town in upstate New York. I don't remember anybody weighing 300 pounds. Uh, and I, you know, and you s just gradually saw that begin to change in how the American public looks. They didn't go back and look at pictures of the Depression or guys going off to uh, World War I or coming home from World War II. They didn't look like our population does now. What caused it? It's multifactorial. Uh, I think you only have to look at the uh, pl how plentiful food is now, um, and so and also uh, how people have begun to look at. I mean, just look at. You used to drink Coke out of a bottle, a little bottle. Now you get it out of half gallon jugs. Um, it's, it's changed. Um, the food has become cheaper. It's more plentiful, and people don't walk or exercise as much as they used to. What do you know about the heart after all these operations uh, other than, I mean I know as a doctor you know a lot about it, but what do you know about the heart that you want the public to know? Well first of all it's an amazing organ. <laughs> it's absolutely incredible. Uh, just, and if you take care of yourself and take care of it, don't smoke and exercise and keep your weight under control, it's going to serve you for a very long time. And what's happened over the years with heart transplants? Well, heart transplants have really uh, become very safe and uh, great long-term results uh, with those. The, the problem of uh, availability hasn't changed. There's probably 30,000 people in the country right now uh, who are a year who are eligible for a heart transplant and only a fraction of that get them. Will there ever be a time when it's a complete artificial heart that somebody can live with? Well, uh, I, I don't know. I mean, we've, that's been the holy grail. Uh, we've been searching that for that for a long time, 50, more than 50 years. It, we're getting closer and closer. I think probably we're going to have better results uh, in more people with a partial ass assisting heart uh, than a total artificial heart. Last question. How do you walk the line with the politicians, the left and the right? I'm not a politician, uh, and you know I, I'm not into uh, running pol in the political arenas. What I'm trying to do is look after a group of people uh, that Cleveland Clinics takes care of, provide them great quality health care, the best I possibly can, uh, and make the organization fiscally sound so that it can produce those sort of results. Dr. Toby Cosgrove, <coughs> CEO of the Cleveland Clinic, thank you very much. It's been my pleasure. For free transcripts or to give us your comments about this program, visit us at qnda.org. Q&A programs are also available as C-SPAN podcasts.